Hello, my name is Bob Edwards and I'm a social worker and psychotherapist. I've also been a professor in the areas of psychology and sociology, particularly uh, as those fields relate to marriage and family. And I'd like to talk to you today about something called gender socialization uh, and how I believe this impacts our perception or our understanding of the Bible. Socialization is a process that occurs throughout our lives and essentially we are socialized by the cultural norms uh, that are present in our environment. So for example it may be a cultural norm to shake hands when you greet somebody. It may be a cultural norm to uh, wave hello, uh, to wave goodbye. Uh, it may be a cultural norm to set your table for dinner in a particular way. Uh, fork on the left, knife on the right. The fork that you're going to use first goes on the outside, etc. Um, these, are all, these are all cultural norms. And essentially, these are, are socialized, pe people are socialized, um, by three essential processes. For one, cultural norms are modeled for us. People role model this. They set an example for us. They show us uh, how we're supposed to sit. They show us how we're expected to dress. They show us how to set our table. Going back to our earlier example, um, the second way that people are socialized is by overt instruction. Sometimes people teach us how to do particular things. I remember when I uh, attended Bible college, they had something called an etiquette dinner. And this etiquette dinner uh, would teach us how to dine as uh, gentlemen and ladies observing a number of social customs that were part of, I suppose, what was referred to as polite society. And uh, it was an interesting educational experience. And we were taught, you know, exactly how this uh, dinner was supposed to unfold, where we were supposed to sit, how we were supposed to sit, what utensils to use for what part of the meal, etc. So there was teaching, there was actual instruction uh, involved in that. There is also something called reinforcement. Now reinforcement is uh, the way we reward people or the way we may withhold rewards from people, the way we may encourage people or discourage people from uh, functioning according to our social customs. At, at the etiquette dinner, for instance, if uh, somebody used the wrong utensil someone else at the table might look at them and frown. Okay, now that's something that we would maybe call negative reinforcement. Uh, if you're getting frowned at, it's a, it's a subtle form of punishment actually. If you're not doing what's expected of you, you get negative feedback from your environment. So you put these three things together, uh, the role modeling, the instruction, and the reinforcement, and, and people are socialized to make the norms of their environment their own internal norms. Okay, so what, is, what begins as, as normative in my surroundings becomes normative within my own mind, my own understanding of how I'm supposed to function. Now socialization, this, this type of socialization, takes place with regard to gender. So we, are, we have role models that show us what it means to be a man in a particular society. We have role models that show us what it means to be a woman in a particular society. Often we are taught uh, overtly what it means to be a man uh, in a certain culture. Talk about Christianity, uh, for example. We may be taught that uh, men are leaders. We may be taught that men are protectors and providers. We may be taught that 
women are supposed to be uh, helpers of men, and oftentimes there's a connotation that goes along with that that suggests that women are subordinate to the man. Men have authority, and uh, women do not, and uh, women must uh, submit themselves to male authority. That can be taught. Oftentimes it's taught, and uh, people make reference to various Bible verses. So in addition, in, in addition to that being taught, as I said, it can be role modeled. The uh, leadership of our churches may consist exclusively of, of men, particularly in certain positions like elders. Uh, depending on your faith tradition, you may have bishops, and uh, they may be exclusively male. I know when I went to uh, church, one of the first churches I attended for a number of years, the um, denomination held that that uh, men are leaders and, and women are helpers and women must submit to male leadership. And if you looked at the front of the church, you could see that model very consistently. The pastor was a man, the youth pastor was a man, all the elders were male. Uh, in fact, all the ushers were male, and generally speaking, women in the congregation uh, did not occupy any positions of uh, leadership authority. Typically, they also didn't uh, teach from the Bible. More than anything, women just sat in the congregation quietly and listened. Sometimes they would, uh, they would uh, play the piano. Uh, while uh, a man led us in worship from our hymn book. So there was, there was teaching, there was modeling, and there was reinforcement. If uh, I remember one time going to a conference, and uh, it, was, it was a conference that was helping young people discover their gifts that we might use in the service of God. And we were there seeking a, a call to ministry, we were to pray and see if God would, would uh, call us into ministry of one form or another. And I remember when, when they were giving the, the talk on ministry and, and gifting and call, the speaker didn't talk about gender. The, he didn't mention that certain forms of ministry were available to men exclusively, and other forms of ministry were perhaps more appropriate for women. Didn't happen to mention that. But there was a very powerful element of reinforcement present, because when a young woman stepped forward to suggest that God had called her to pastoral ministry, a number of my male colleagues that were present at this conference reacted with uh, a mixture of, of criticism and uh, what I would say looked like uh, outrage, frankly. They were very upset with this young woman for daring to suggest that God might call her to pastoral ministry. And essentially they ridiculed her uh, with a number of different comments until, uh, in tears, she withdrew from the group, left the conference, and uh, didn't return. So that was a very powerful form of reinforcement. Uh, if you don't do what's expected of you in this environment, we'll, we'll, we'll make that painful for you, is, is exactly what happened. And on the other hand, I was encouraged, even though I was a new Christian, and didn't really understand much about the Bible at the time, I was encouraged to, to pursue uh, pastoral ministry. And looking back, I see that that's the case because I was, I was male. And so, whereas my sister in Christ experienced negative reinforcement for not obeying the sort of unspoken rules of that, of that conference, I experienced the opposite, I experienced positive reinforcement, encouragement, and affirmation. Socialization is, is sometimes uh, affected by
by people who act as if certain things are simply true. Even if they're not spoken overtly, people just act like it's true. People may act as if, for example, uh, women are less capable of leadership and decision making. Now they, they act like that simply by not allowing women to make leadership decisions. And they may act like men are capable of making leadership decisions and they may act that way simply by ensuring that all the positions on decision making boards are held by men. So this is also a form of, of socialization. And the end result of social, the socialization process, as I suggested earlier, is that the norms that exist in the culture around us become the norms that exist in our own minds. So the, these external norms become internal norms. And, and in fact, some researchers, and uh, particularly in the field of the social sciences, uh, cognitive psychology, the psychology of perception specifically, they talk about cognitive lenses through which we make sense of the world around us. So if I've been socialized to believe that men lead and women follow, women submit, if I've been socialized to believe that men are perhaps more fit uh, for certain positions uh, in the church, if I've been socialized to believe that, that men are more fit for positions of leadership in the home, then I am going to uh, internalize those norms and I will automatically assign certain uh, meanings to the word man and I will automatically assign certain meanings to the word woman. So, and we do this by association. If somebody says uh, man, I may automatically think leader. If somebody says woman, I may automatically think helper. And interestingly, some cognitive psychologists study the brain and ha how it functions biologically. And these associations that we make because of socialization, because of our cognitive lenses, actually take place in the brain. Uh, according to one researcher by the name of Nico Frigia, within 0 0.07 millionths of a second. That's fast. And so we don't always realize that socialization is at work when we're looking at the world around us, when we're making sense of the world around us. Uh, we don't realize that our socialization is affecting how we actually see things, how we make sense of them, the meanings we attach to things. And interestingly, this uh, affects how we see, how we perceive, how we make sense of the Bible. And what I'd like to talk about now is the cognitive lenses of some of the most influential theologians throughout church history. Um, I'd like to begin by looking at the fourth century in particular, looking at uh, Saint uh, some people say it Augustine, some people say it Augustine. I'll, I'll probably go back and forth because I've, I've heard both on numerous occasions. And that's role modeling and socialization. So, St. Augustine was uh, a Roman bishop and he lived in the 4th century AD at a time when the church had just become the official state religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, frankly, I find that very significant. Uh, I find it significant because the Roman Empire was absolutely dominated by men. Uh, the households in Rome, uh, men were referred to as the pater familia, and uh, that essentially meant that you know the, the, the rule of the fathers was the cultural norm of the day and the father of a household had absolute sway, uh, absolute rule over his uh, wife, over his children, over his slaves, and I don't use the term metaphorically. This was a time in, in history when slavery was incredibly prevalent and, uh, and normative. It was normal to have slaves, to own other human beings. 
uh, would do our labor for us. If we were Roman men in particular. And not only was Rome a profoundly pa patriarchal culture, but the dominant philosophy of the day was uh, rooted in the, the thinking of, of prominent Greek scholars uh, like Plato and uh, Aristotle. And uh, there were some what were called Neo-Platonic philosophers that were incredibly popular, particularly in the 4th century, and especially to St. Augustine. And uh, one of those uh, philosophers' name was Plotinus, and his work is recorded by one of his uh, followers in, uh, in a, a body of literature referred to as the uh, Enneads. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly because I'm quite sure it's not an English word. But uh, anyway, I've read the work uh, as it's been translated into English. And it's fascinating, frankly. Now, St. Augustine, why does it matter that he was interested in the work of, of Plotinus? Why does it matter that uh, Plotinus was uh, a follower, a student, a disciple of Plato? Well, St. Augustine at one point said that when he became a Christian and tried to make sense of the Bible, it was very difficult for him. It, it, it came across to him uh, almost as though it was nonsense. He just had a hard time making sense of it. It didn't, uh, it didn't really mesh with the way he was accustomed to thinking about the world. And so, he says that he read from uh, a number of books that were written by philosophers uh, who followed the train of thought or the school of thought begun by Plato. And uh, he went as far as to say that he he did this work of the Platonists, he called them, helped him to make sense of the Bible. So in other words, the work of Plato and then later the work of Plotinus, th these, these works became the cognitive lenses through which St. Augustine made sense of the Bible. Now I'd like to share a few examples of Plato's philosophy, uh, particularly as it seems to have influenced St. Augustine. So this is from, this is from Plato, uh, specifically his work entitled The Republic. And it reads as follows, uh, Let me further note that the manifold and complex pleasures and desires and pains are generally found in children and women and servants, whereas the simple and moderate desires which follow reason and are under the guidance of the mind and true opinion are to be found only in a few, and those the best born and best educated. Very true. These, as you may per uh, perceive, these two different groups have a place in our state, and the meaner desires of the many are held down by the virtuous desires and wisdom of the few. Seeing, then, that there are distinct classes, any meddling of one with the other, or the change of one into another, is the greatest harm to the state, and may be most justly termed evil doing. This, then, is injustice. You are quite right, someone replied, in maintaining the general inferiority of the female sex. All these are, are excerpts from Plato's Republic. And the worldview that is put forward by Plato is that a just state is made up of uh, a hierarchy of classes and that the highest class is made up of the best born and the best educated, and these were exclusively men. And uh, the reasoning, the desires of the many, uh, particularly women and uh, servants or slaves, needs, need to be held down or kept in check by the wisdom of the best born and the best educated men. And so, 
uh, Plato is talking about a class-based society with men at the top, best born men, so your, your, your blood, your ethnicity, your family line, your race, perhaps even had something to do with your alleged superiority, your gender had something to do with your superiority, and then your education would also contribute to this sense of intellectual and moral superiority. And uh, women were presumed to be intellectually and morally inferior, and so they needed to be ruled over by, uh, by their superiors, specifically men. And any mixing of these classes was described by Plato as an injustice. And so, we understand that St. Augustine uh, was using the philosophical lenses of, of Plato to make sense of the Bible, and when he read the Bible, this is what he saw. I'll quote from uh, one of his works called Questions on the Heptateuch, uh, Book 1, Section 153. It is the natural order among people that women serve their husbands and children their parents, because the justice of this lies in the principle that the lesser serves the greater. This is the natural justice that the weaker brain serve the stronger. This, therefore, is the evident justice in the relationships between slaves and their masters, that they who excel in reason excel in power. So we see the same concepts here in the work of uh, St. Augustine, uh, 4th century AD, and he is seeing the world through the lenses of a philosopher from ancient Greece, the 4th century BC. We see the same uh, understanding of, of justice is a class-based society, and that men are in the superior class uh, and must rule, and women are in the inferior class and must be ruled over and must serve. Now, in case anyone is wondering why I think uh, Augustine was, in fact, influenced by the works of Plato, he, he says it himself in his Confessions. Uh, he says it repeatedly. Here's just one quotation from Book 8, Chapter 2. Uh, Simplicianus congratulated me that I had not fallen upon the writings of other philosophers, which were full of fallacies and deceit after the beggarly elements of this world, where, as in the Platonists, at every turn, the pathway led to belief in God and His Word. Okay? So, St. Augustine is viewing the works of Plato as being in line at every turn, quote-unquote, with the Word of God. Now, the uh, writing of St. Augustine, people might wonder, you know, why am I talking about people from 400 uh, BC? Why am I talking about people from 400 AD? Well, the Protestant Reformation, also called the Great Awakening, uh, was an important event in church history. A number of positive developments, I think, uh, occurred during that time period through the likes of um, reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin, and uh, also Arminius. John Calvin is a theologian that is frequently referred to by present-day complementarian um, teachers, pastors, and scholars. Uh, I, I read, for example, the uh, book that's edited by Wayne Grudem and John Piper, uh, I believe it's entitled Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and uh, many authors contribute to the work. One thing that I noticed is that uh, various authors that contributed to this, this particular complementarian text cite John Calvin and his commentary work um, especially his commentary work on the, uh, the epistles, uh, and, you know, oftentimes John Calvin also 
would um, make sense of the relationships between men and women on the basis of his understanding of the uh, creation account found in the book of Genesis. Now what's interesting about John Calvin is I was uh, reading a book on, on the history of his life and the history of his work and then of course I read his, his institutes as well as his own commentaries on the Bible. And he, much like St. Augustine admits to seeing the Bible through the lenses of Plato and his philosophy, John Calvin admits to seeing the Bible through the lenses of the work of St. Augustine. And so you have these lenses, this worldview, being passed down through literature, through teaching, and it was also modeled for uh, St. Augustine in his culture, it was also modeled for John Calvin in his, his uh, uh, context, in his time of day, uh, or his era, I should say, in Europe, that uh, men were leaders, and women were helpers, and uh, men were believed and perceived to be intellectually and morally superior, and women were believed to be morally and intellectually inferior. And so, uh, so it is the case, though, that Plato's lenses were passed down to St. Augustine, and Augustine's lenses were passed down through education and modeling and reinforcement, gender socialization, to John Calvin. How do we know that? Because John Calvin said, Augustine, or Augustine if you prefer, is so holy with me that if I wished to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. Now, um, John Calvin uh, is speaking about uh, a number of things here when he talks about making sense of the Bible through St. Augustine's lenses. Uh, in particular, he's, he, he often explains the problem of evil uh, and sin through the lenses of, of St. Augustine's theology. And uh, St. Augustine borrowed many of his concepts, as I've, as I've said, from Plato. But it's not just the problem of evil that Calvin seems to have borrowed from Augustine. It is also his understanding of male and female relationships. And uh, here is a quote uh, from John Calvin about women in particular. Let the woman be satisfied with her state of subjection and not take it amiss that she is made inferior to the more distinguished sex. Same language as Augustine, the same language as Plato. And um, Many of the authors of Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, uh, many of the members of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood identify themselves as uh, strictly Calvinists in their theology. I've read a number of uh, the works of John Piper, for example, and, and he's uh, incredibly enthusiastic about John Calvin and his work. In fact, in his uh, blog, Desiring God.org, uh, uh, John Piper refers to himself as a seven-point Calvinist, and there traditionally are only five main points to the, to the theological system. So, so we have the case that uh, lenses from the fourth century BC are showing up in present-day commentaries of the Bible. And so how does this, how does this uh, show up in our understanding of the Bible? Well, I mentioned that, that uh, St. Augustine uh, and Calvin really attempt to make sense of the problem of evil. And they did that by looking at the Genesis account in particular. And both of them attached great significance to the, uh, their, their view, their understanding of, of Adam and Eve in the Genesis account. There are assumptions that appear to be made by Augustine to begin with that because uh, Adam was made first and uh, Eve was made second that uh, Adam was was in charge 
And it's interesting, the Apostle Paul, when he writes about that in 1 Corinthians, he explains that uh, even though the first woman came from man, all men came from women, and both come from God. So, I'm not sure that the order of creation, as it's referred to, is, a, is an indication of uh, leadership, authority, or a male-dominated hierarchy. Certainly, uh, a male-dominated hierarchy is not explicitly spelled out in the Genesis account when it talks about, you know, Adam being created and then uh, the person who's later called Eve being taken from uh, his side. So, Saint, uh, Saint Augustine also makes a, a particularly platonic assumption about the verse in Genesis in which Adam describes Eve as bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now, I mean, uh, at face value, when you read the passages, uh, Adam uh, had Eve taken from his side. Some translations say rib. Uh, there's, you know, people debate whether or not that's incredibly accurate. I, I think probably the most accurate rendering in English is simply to say that Eve was taken from Adam's side. Um, but this bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, is just acknowledging, you know, this person is is taken from me, the same stuff that I'm made of. My bone is your bone. My flesh is your flesh. But St. Augustine didn't see it that way. When he saw the use of the word flesh in the, the creation account found in, in the book of Genesis, he automatically assumed that the flesh referred to something lower than the intellect, something more vulnerable to temptation. And he explains this. Let's see if I can find a specific quote for that. Okay, yeah, I found that quote that I was looking for from uh, St. Augustine. And it is from on uh, John, Tractate 2, Section 14. And this is what he says. And how are they born? Because they become sons of God and brethren of Christ. They are certainly born. For if they are not born, how can they be sons? But the sons of men are born of flesh and blood. The apostle puts flesh for the woman, because when she was made of his rib, Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And the, and the apostle saith, He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh. Flesh, then, is put for the woman, in the same manner that spirit is sometimes put for the husband. Wherefore? because the one rules, the other is ruled. The one ought to command, the other to serve. For where the flesh commands and the spirit serves, the house is turned the wrong way. What can be worse than a house where the woman has the mastery over the man? But that house is rightly ordered when the man commands and the woman obeys. In like manner, that man is rightly ordered where the spirit commands and the flesh serves. So that's St. Augustine, or Augustine, explaining how he makes sense of uh, Adam's reference to Eve as bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, and then of course the Apostle Paul later makes references um, to those passages as well. And St. Augustine, the, the automatic uh, perception of the woman being referred to as flesh is that she must be ruled and that there's something not quite right with her that uh, that the man equals the spirit and just as the spirit must rule over the flesh which isn't quite right the man must rule over the woman now what I find incredibly fascinating about this piece of commentary is that the man frankly is never compared to the spirit uh, St. Augustine projects that concept onto the Bible. In other words, he sees what isn't really there, but he is seeing what he already believes. And from his own testimony, we know that he believes this partly 
because he identified so strongly with the philosophical works of Plato from the 4th century BC. Uh, it is also the case that um, St. Augustine had male leadership role modeled for him in, in the culture of Rome, but specifically he had this modeled for him in his own home, in which he writes that his father dominated his mother, which included physical beatings, which the mother blamed herself for, and St. Augustine agreed that that was right. So we have the role modeling, we have uh, the role modeling of male domination reinforced in the home through violence, we have specific teaching of male dominance through the philosophical work of Plato, and we evidently have St. Augustine internalizing all of this gender socialization in such a way that the norms in his culture became his own norms within his, within his own mind, they became his mindset, they became the lenses through which he made sense of the Bible and understood God's revelation. Um, but we can see that his understanding is, is flawed because the man is not compared to the spirit in this, and, and a woman is not compared to the flesh in the sense that she is somehow uh, evil. Or, or, or less than um, a man. But I do not believe this is what Adam had in mind when he referred to Eve as, as bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Adam, obviously, uh, historically, precedes Plato and uh, did not seem to have a platonic view uh, of his wife. That's being projected onto Adam just as it's being projected onto Paul. And, uh, and the epistles written by Paul that are found in the New Testament. Now, I'm suggesting that these norms have also been internalized by present day uh, teachers, commentators, and, uh, and, and that they have also been internalized historically by Bible translators. And I think that for a number of reasons. And, uh, and I'd like to share with you some of the discrepancies we can find uh, in our translations of the Bible. Some of which seem to, to suggest a profoundly patriarchal lens is being used to make sense of the text. One of the examples that comes to mind for me that is, is perhaps most prominent can be found in the book of Isaiah, and uh, chapter 3, verse 12. The King James Bible, for instance, says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. So, women ruling over Israel is apparently a bad thing. And, and we see this despite the fact that in the Old Testament, uh, Deborah was a judge, uh, and the Old Testament explains that uh, judges did, in fact, have leadership responsibilities. One translation, in the book of Ruth, the first chapter, refers to the judges ruling over Israel. And people went to Deborah seeking wisdom. And she would sit uh, under a, a particular tree, and she would render judgment. Uh, because she was a judge and a leader, uh, she was also prophetic, and this was this was good. This was this was of God. Uh, she was God's spokesperson, and in fact, even gave instructions to a man who was to lead the army of Israel into battle. So she is uh, a leader over Israel, and has God's blessing and enabling to fulfill this function. So. Why, in the book of Isaiah, does, does it seem to suggest, in chapter 3, verse 12, that, that women ruling over Israel is a bad thing? Well, if we look at the Greek Septuagint, the, version of the, the Greek version of what we now call the Old Testament, this same verse gives us a completely different understanding. 
translated into the English directly from the Greek, we have the verse saying, O oh my people, your extractors strip you, and extortioners rule over you. So, what we have is uh, different translations essentially relying on, on um, additions made by, by scribes uh, many, many, many generations after the, the text was, was originally written. And depending on these small marks added to the text by scribes, you could either translate the uh, passage as saying that children are oppressors and women rule over them, or you could translate that as extractors and extortioners are being oppressive and ruling over Israel. And uh, the King James Version of the Bible was translated all by men uh, at, a, at a period in history when male domination was normative in the culture. And the um, theological work of St. Augustine was, uh, was prominent from the 4th century on, and particularly uh, through the Middle Ages. The work of St. Augustine and the translation work of St. Jerome, he translated the Bible from, from its original languages uh, into Latin. This work was incredibly um, influential when it came to making sense of the Bible throughout the Middle Ages. And uh, I think that helps us understand why the King James Bible suggests that women ruling is a bad thing, in spite of Deborah, and it contradicts the uh, translation we find in the Septuagint. Now we also find other discrepancies. When we read in uh, New Testament Greek, for example, I was, I was very pleased to be able to study New Testament Greek at the University of Waterloo under a, a wonderful man by the name of Dr. Frick. And as I was reading the, the Greek New Testament manuscripts that were made available to us from the uh, Canadian Bible Society, it struck me that Phoebe was referred to in the Greek as, uh, as a deacon. Uh, diakonos is the, the actual word that's used to describe her. And then again in the King James Bible, we find her referred to as a, uh, as a servant rather than a deacon, or sometimes the uh, word diakonos is translated minister. Later, Phoebe is referred to um, with a, a noun in Greek, prostatis. And this uh, a verb form of this, uh, of this word is used repeatedly throughout the New Testament to indicate positions of leadership and ruling. And yet, the King James Bible translates the, uh, the noun prostatus, in Phoebe's case, simply as helper. Uh, I think the, the Old English is succorer. Uh, but the, the, the meanings are to be a helper, to be a servant, um, and there's no suggestion whatsoever that Phoebe could be in a position of, of leadership. Now there's an excellent article that expands on this uh, in great detail, written by Elizabeth A. McCabe, and uh, I, have, I have that here. You, could, you can find that on, online if you wanted to uh, read that for yourself. I'm going to see if there's a link here. And there is. It's www.sbl-site.org. And if you were to Google Elizabeth A. McCabe, M. Small C, Large C, A. B. E., uh, the title of the article is A Reexamination of Phoebe as Diaconus and Prostatus, Exposing the Inaccuracies of English Translations. She does a fantastic job. Of, of pointing out how the words used to describe Phoebe are the same words used to describe uh, Paul, Timothy, and even the elders. When Paul writes about elders in 1 Timothy 5, 17, for example, he uses 
uh, a verb form of prostatis to refer to uh, elders and their leadership, their ruling, uh, and he uses the verb form of prostatis there, and it's the same word that is used to Phoebe, but it's translated differently. Apparently, simply because she's a woman. Now, some people have suggested to me that the translation is, is different for Phoebe because of the context of the passage, but to be, to be honest, I don't understand uh, where they would get that idea because in Romans chapter 16, where Phoebe is, uh, her ministry is being described, she is very simply being introduced and commended by the Apostle Paul for her work in the church. So there's no evident contextual reason from the, the passages themselves in Romans chapter 16 suggesting that we should translate uh, diaconus and prostatus differently for Phoebe than we should for Paul, for Timothy, for the elders, for other deacons uh, in the New Testament. It seems as though whoever translated these passages for the, New, for the King James Version of the Bible and other English translations, it seems as though they saw a woman and thought helper. They saw a woman and thought servant. It, it may never have occurred to them that a woman could be a deacon, could be a minister, could be a, a, a leader, perhaps even a ruler in the church. So I think that's important to point out. Another example of uh, problematic translation occurs in Ephesians uh, chapter 5. We've got the oldest known Greek manuscript of this epistle talks about submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. Many of us know that that's in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. And there's, there's one instance of this particular verb, uh, submit, that is used in Ephesians 5.21. In later manuscripts, of the same epistle, we have uh, another instance of the verb, ad apparently added to the text uh, by scribes in, in later editions. Initially in, in Greek, in the, in the later Byzantine text, and what we find in Ephesians 5.22 in these later manuscripts is a command directed specifically to wives that says, wives, submit to your husbands, or as the New American Standard Bible translated, translates it, wives, be subject to your husbands. Now, it's, it's one thing to say, be subject one to another out of reverence for Christ, and then provide examples of uh, how that might apply to wives initially, and then how that might apply to husbands later on in the passage. For example, uh, the uh, Ephesians 5.22 if the additional verb, the additional command, be subject to husbands is not added in, we still do have the example of, of it says, it reads specifically, uh, be subject one to another out of reverence for Christ, uh, wives to your husbands, as, as to the Lord. And, and then later on, we have a, a depiction of husbands being asked to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Interestingly, I find what is, what is depicted for us there isn't Jesus, the Lord of the church, the commander-in-chief, the one who uh, gives instructions and must be obeyed. That's not, that's not the aspect of Christ's uh, example and ministry that husbands are commanded to emulate here. What they are commanded to emulate, to follow, is it is where Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. Uh, and Philippians tells us in chapter 2, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he took upon himself the form of a servant and was obedient even to the point of death on the cross. And this is the example that husbands are, are told to follow in um, the verses in, in Ephesians chapter 5. So we have one use of the verb, submit one to another, out of reverence for Christ. Wives to your husbands, as to the Lord. And later we have these instructions for husbands as to how they are supposed to serve their wives. 
and it's it's I don't believe it's wrong to suggest that service is what's being thought of here because Jesus himself said uh, the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and become a ransom for many he even talks about the greatest among you will be the slave of all so this is this is powerful language you know where Jesus is, is trying to teach his followers that there is a different way he wants them to relate to one another he doesn't want them to follow after the patterns of of, of cultures pagan cultures that don't know God okay where people are seeking to have power over each other and they were thinking that the greatest person in a particular society is the one who is in charge and uh, Jesus tries to get them to forget all about that and just focus on serving and uh, he modeled that for example when he washed the disciples feet girded himself, dressed himself like a slave, in fact, before he then went on to perform what was known to be a slave's function in that culture. It was washing the dirt, the mud, of the feet of his followers. And uh, I was reading in one of John Piper's uh, books where he said, but, but the disciples still knew, knew who was in charge. They still knew who the Lord was. And to be honest, I don't think, I don't think that fits the disciples' reaction to Jesus' behavior. When Jesus girded himself like a slave and, and was prepared to wash the disciples' feet, Peter's first reaction was to forbid it. He said, no. No, Lord. How can you do this? You can't do this. I won't permit it. I won't accept you functioning as my slave. And, uh, and Jesus said, if you if, if you want to be clean, you, if you want to be mine, if you want to be my disciple, be my follower, uh, you have to allow me to do this. And, uh, and so then finally Peter did allow uh, Jesus to wash his feet. So there's, there's an incredible example being set, role modeling, by Jesus for his disciples. Then he tells his disciples, as I have done for you, do for one another. Uh, another part of the Bible, the New Testament, he says, a new commandment I give to you, as I have loved you, love one another. And uh, one translation of uh, Philippians chapter 2 says, in all your relationships, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who didn't see his... God's authority as something to be grasped and used to his own advantage, but rather he took upon himself the form of a servant and served in love. And so I, I, when I look at Ephesians chapter 5, and when we, we don't add in the additional command directed specifically to wives to be subject to your husbands, we get a picture of Christians, men and women, husbands and wives, Submitting to one another, serving one another in love, uh, as as Christ loved us. I think, frankly, that that's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful picture. Now, another uh, Bible verse that I, I think is problematic in terms of its translation that I want to focus on specifically is First Timothy, chapter two, and and many of us are familiar with this, and it is. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 12 through to 15. Okay. So 1 first, first Timothy 2, verse 12, is typically translated, uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. And then uh, Paul goes on to make reference to the creation account. Uh, with uh, Eve being deceived and Adam not being deceived. And he also makes reference to being saved in childbearing. And the church has struggled to make sense of that particular verse for centuries. Now, the, one of the main verbs used in this uh, particular portion of the Bible, some, some have probably done some research on this. It is uh, authentane. It's an infinitive Greek verb. 
It's used one time in the New Testament. Most of the other times, authority is uh, made reference to in the New Testament. It is translated authority from the word exousia, which has a clear indication of, of authority. Often pain, however, can't be found elsewhere in the Bible unless we look at the wisdom literature found in the Septuagint, specifically the uh, wisdom of Solomon. And uh, in the wisdom of Solomon, there's a noun form of this verb that is almost identical to authentain, it's authentas, and it refers to people who commit murder as a ritual sacrifice in the worship of a false god or an idol. And so there's absolutely no sense of, of positive authority with this word authentas as it's found in the wisdom of Solomon in the Septuagint. So, why do we have uh, ritual murder on one hand for authentas and exercise authority on the other hand in uh, Paul's epistle. Well, that's a very long story, to be perfectly honest with you. And uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize the situation briefly. The word authentain um, became associated with authority largely through the work of the early church fathers, Greek and Roman, who, who began to use it uh, in this sense, almost exclusively. And um, there are a few references to uh, some form of the word authentain during the New Testament era that do seem to, to, to equate with uh, exercise authority. So I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that that's not a possible meaning for the word. However, it's certainly not the most common use of the word, and as I mentioned earlier, it's not the uh, manner in which the word is used in the Septuagint, in the Wisdom of Solomon. Now, a, a book was published in 2010 that does an extensive study of all the variations of the word authentain. Authenteo is an, an, another form of the verb. And... Uh, and it looks at the uses of this word from 200 B.C. to 200 A.D. And the, the biblical era, the New Testament era, is the intentional center of this range. And Leland Wilshire is making, making use of a, a, an online computer database that includes every use of this word throughout the history of Greek literature. And in fact, he looks at over 300 instances of the manner in which this word is used in Greek. But in this range from 200 BC to 280, in which the New Testament era is the intentional center, we have the following meanings. Authentine meant, or a form of it meant, to be a doer of a massacre, an author of a crime, perpetrator of a sacrilege, supporter of violent actions, a murderer of oneself, a perpetrator of a slaughter, a murderer, a slayer, a slayer of oneself, authority, a perpetrator of evil, or one who murders by his own hand. So, uh, and if you're interested in the historical sources for all of these different meanings for the variations of the word authentane throughout history, they, uh, they are Polybius, Diodorus Siculus, Philo, Appian of Alexander, Arrhenius, one of the uh, early church fathers who, who referred to authentane as authority, Harpocration, Phrynichus, uh, and all of these, as I say, are cited in Wilshire's book, which was published in 2010, um, which, I, which I quite enjoy. Let me see if I have a, actually the name of the book present with me. You might benefit from, uh, from reading it. Yes, Will, uh, Wilshire, Leland, 2010, Insight into Two Biblical Passages, Anatomy of a Prohibition. 1 Timothy 2.12, the, um, the uh, TLG computer, and the Christian church. And that's by uh, 
Univers the University Press of America is the publisher. So that should give you everything you need to be able to to be able to find that. So if we're going to uh, try to decide which of these possible meanings for oftentime is the best to use in our English translations, we need to look at the context, we're told, of the letter. We're also, we also should probably look at the context of the intended audience of the letter. And the context of the letter is that Paul was writing uh, to Timothy, who was pastoring in Ephesus. And Paul was incredibly concerned about false teaching. He was concerned about people who were forbidding marriage. They were uh, encouraging people to abstain from marriage and, and sexual activity in particular. And they were also commanding people to abstain from the eating of certain foods. They thought that their lifestyle of self-denial uh, gave them special knowledge uh, about God, special revelation from God, and they thought that this revelation made them teachers of the law, uh, better teachers of the law. And Paul says, however, to Timothy, guard against those things that are falsely called knowledge. And these people call themselves teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. And if, you know, we talked, I talked about some of these uses of the word oftentime being from historians like Theodorus Siculus and others. And these historians, not only do they make use of the word uh, oftentime repeatedly, but they also describe the culture of, uh, of Ephesus. They, they describe it in these terms. And I'll read from from Diodorus Siculus, and he was a first century BC historian, and he says, Beside the river of Thermodon, therefore, a nation ruled by females held sway, in which women pursued the arts of war just like men. To the men she relegated the spinning of wool and other household tasks of women. She promulgated laws whereby she led forth the women to war, to martial strife, while on the men, excuse me, she fashioned humiliation and servitude. She would maim the arms and legs of male children, make them useless for service in war. And I took that from a book uh, by uh, an author, Murphy, 1989. Let me see if I can get more information on that for you. Yeah, a translation with notes of Book 2 of the Library of History of Diodorus Siculus. Okay? Now, another um, first century BC historian tells us more about this culture, this nation ruled by females. They also dismissed all thought of intermarriage with their neighbors, calling it slavery rather than marriage. They embarked instead upon an enterprise unparalleled in the whole of history, that of building up a state without men, and then actually defending it themselves out of contempt for the male sex. Then, with peace assured by their military success, they entered into sexual relationships with surrounding peoples so that their line would not die out. Males born of such unions they put to death, but girls they brought up in a way that adapted them to their own way of life. After conquering in Europe, they also seized a number of city-states in Asia. Here they founded Ephesus. And that can be found as a translation in a book by an author named Yardley. Let me see if I can get the reference material for that, so you can uh, you can look that up if you like. Okay, Epitome of the Philippic History of Pompeius Trojus, Scholars Press, Atlanta, Georgia. That's Yardley, J, 1994. Okay, so uh, there are also historians, more recently, who examined this uh, culture in which women were clearly dominant and men were maimed or put to death to ensure that women would rule in this culture. These other authors, uh, I'll quote from Farnell and Ferguson in particular, talk about the spiritual life of this culture in Ephesus, which as you, as of course, as you remember, is where Timothy was preaching. And this was the intended definition of uh, destination, sorry, of Paul's letter. 
Spiritually, women were good. They were seen as pure and the source of life. Uh, female deities also were seen as good and as a source of life. Men were, were viewed as a source of evil, and evil was particularly associated with male sexuality. Now, in Ephesus in particular, the deity that was worshipped uh, was referred to as Sibylla by the indigenous people of Ephesus, this culture ruled by women in Asia Minor. When Greeks emigrated to uh, this part of the world, they called that goddess Artemis. Uh, Greeks were famous for this. They would go to new lands and, and, uh, and, and influence those lands. One of the ways that they influenced the new lands that they, that they traveled to was to take indigenous deities and give them names of their own gods and goddesses. So they, they called the, uh, the goddess Sibylla in Ephesus Artemis. And then uh, the temple of Artemis became world-renowned. But historically, the, the name and character of this goddess was, uh, was previously known as Sibylla. And uh, if you wanted to be a priest in the service of Sibylla, you could do so, but you had to relinquish your, ma your manhood. Literally, you had to be castrated. And, and men castrated themselves so that they would be acceptable to the goddess, because male sexuality in that, that culture was viewed as a source of evil, okay? And so uh, women in this culture wanted to bear children. As we've, we've seen, they would mate with people from surrounding um, tribes or, or nations or areas. But it was interesting. After mating, they would, have, they would have, of course, uh, uh, at times, become pregnant and, and be giving birth, and the, morta the mortality rate, like women died in childbirth frequently in that day and age, and Sibylla was the goddess to whom they called for help to be saved in childbearing, and uh, I think that's incredibly significant, uh, because here we have this verse uh, right after 1 Timothy 2.12 that talks about women being saved in childbearing through through faith and holiness and propriety, which is good for every Christian to be saved uh, spiritually through faith and holiness. Or faith that produces holiness, I think is probably a good way to, to think of it. And so, why would Paul write about salvation in childbirth? Well, this culture called upon their goddess to uh, save them in childbearing. And, not only that, they saw women as the source of life and purity, and men as the source of evil. Well, it's no surprise, then, that Paul might write to Timothy about this culture, remind them that Adam was also a source of life. So I think it's also important to look at the use of the word authentine in light of this culture. Is it referring to simply exercising authority? Or is it talking about some form of ritual violence? And uh, if Paul is addressing a culture that worships Sibylla, that sees women as, as dominant, that sees male sexuality as unacceptable, that encourages men to make themselves holy by denying the body, even to the point of doing violence to themselves, the violence of, of uh, ritual emasculation, is it really likely that Paul is saying all women should not simply have authority over men in the church? Or is he saying that women should not teach and practice ritual violence against men? And frankly, I think that uh, the repeated use of the word oftentimes to make reference to violence, murder, sacrilege, ritual violence, and culture uh, in Ephesus, particularly the spiritual culture in Ephesus that Paul himself seemed deeply concerned about, I think these contextual factors suggest that it would be much more accurate 
to translate authentic in terms of some kind of uh, violence or abusive domination. And, and why has the Bible historically seemed to overlook all these prevalent, most common meanings of the word authentic? Why has, have Bible translators overlooked the Ephesian context of female domination? I think um, Leland Wilshire highlights how this started when he looks at St. Jerome's 4th century translation of the Bible. He, he translates often pain, not in terms of violence, but in terms of leadership. He says that often pain should be translated into the Latin dominari, which could either mean dominate or, or exercise dominion over men. And so, so this is the f one of the first instances of translation from the Greek into another language, uh, and the notion of violence, of murder, of suicide, or anything, anything like that, of sacrilege, is lost uh, in the translation. Later translations then even lose um, sight of the sense of domination that is at least present in the Latin and uh, in the Middle Ages, in the Reformation, um, Bibles that were translated into uh, German and later English translations then begin to talk about authentic simply in terms of exercising authority. But I, as I, now as I've, I've, I've been attempting to explain, I think the mindset of the translator plays a pivotal role in this process. If uh, somebody doesn't believe women can have authority over men, if they've already internalized that cultural norm, if it's become their cognitive lens through which they make sense of the world and the Bible, and you see this word in the Bible, uh, how are you going to translate it? I think people just make these um, decisions in translation on the basis of their own socialization. And at times, it seems to me, there's mounting evidence that uh, our gender socialization does impact the cognitive lenses through which we make sense of the world around us. And that includes how we make sense of the Bible. And so sometimes we may see what appears to be a male-dominated higher gen uh, gender hierarchy in the Bible but we may be seeing what we've already internalized as normal, and that might not be an accurate reflection of the original language of the Bible as, or the original message as it was intended by the author in its original cultural context. So I hope that uh, gives everybody something to think about and to pray about, and uh, what, I, what I really do think we should all reflect on is, you know, what are my cultural lenses, what what has my role modeling been, what has my teaching been, what has my reinforcement been, uh, have I been raised in a patriarchal family structure, have I been raised in a patriarchal social culture, um, have I been raised in a, in a patriarchal church, am I reading uh, translations of the Bible in English that add uh, verses that don't appear in the Greek, that add headings that, that encourage female submission. What is my gender socialization and how is that impacting how, how I look at the Bible and, and what I think God is saying about uh, the role of women in the church and in the home. May God bless you and lead you and help you as you reflect on that uh, prayerfully. In Jesus' name, thank you.